So Neil Young, a singer, 60% of his music is streamed through Spotify. And Joe Rogan has the most popular podcast, maybe in the world, but certainly on, on Spotify. And he expressed some, uh, Joe expressed some views that Neil Young disagreed with. And so Neil Young said, basically, I cancel you. Right. Spotify, I cancel you, Spotify. I cancel you, Joe, Joe Rogan. I just cancel everybody. I'm pulling out. I'm withdrawing because if you're going to talk about something I don't like, then I'm no longer talking with you. That is cancel culture. And it's happened to so many celebrities, Chris Harrison, J.K. Rowling, the My Pillow guy, like just, just person after person. If you say the wrong thing, you are canceled. I, you are dead to me. I am done talking with you. We only talk with people we agree with. That's the culture of the world. But no one wants to be canceled. Yuck. That feels terrible. And I, I want to say very clearly, that is not our culture. <laughs> that is not the church culture. Uh, church, capital C, around the world. That is not Jesus' culture. It's not a cancel culture. It's a culture of love, acceptance, forgiveness, dialogue, all that stuff. So in this world and in the clash between two systems, the world system and the kingdom of God, it's easy to have a couple different reactions. One sort of normal, understandable reaction is when we just withdraw. Like we just clam up because, oh no, I don't want to say the wrong thing and be canceled. So it's easy just to live life kind of looking over your shoulder, uh, worried about what you said or you know, who's going to be mad at you or who's going to cancel you, who's going to walk out of your life or fire you or whatever. And it's easy to never share your faith in Jesus. It is easy to get that way. It's, it's great. Just come here in the bubble. We enjoy each other. But out there, man, tight-lipped. That's one kind of understandable reaction to what's going on in our world today. Another one that I see in and outside the church is the reaction, all right, come on, let's go. I'll take you on, and we just can, we got the world at our fingertips on social media, and it's so easy just to go on there, and you know what, what sentences are going to push the cultural hot buttons. You know what newscast is going to, if you can just send a clip of that, you know what's going to push the buttons out there, and you, it's so easy just to pick a fight. That's another kind of response to this clash between the world system and the kingdom of God. But I have a question for you today. What is Jesus calling you to do? So we know what's going on in the world. We know what's the easy defaults, quietness or combat. We know that though that's kind of what naturally happens. But what does Jesus calling you as a believer in Jesus Christ, what is he calling you to do? And the follow-up question is, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do what Jesus is calling you to do, which might be different than your defaults? Would you turn in the Bible to Acts chapter 1? And we're in a series in the book of Acts. is Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. And, and we're, we're talking about the great beginnings of the early church. And along the road, we're kind of looking at some of our beginnings as well as a church. And the time period that we're in, in, in the, the, the setting, the story we're going to read about today, is that for 40 days after Jesus died and rose again, he showed up at gatherings of his disciples. And, you know, one thing I have pointed out is there was always food there. <laughs> I just love it. Jesus is my guy. I mean, like, you got any broiled fish? I mean, that's, like, how many times does he say that in the Bible? It's so awesome. I love it. Because he knows that where there's food, there's fellowship and connection. Yeah. Uh, and he, it also, he was letting everyone know, I am alive again. I am not a ghost. Ghosts don't eat. I'm alive again. You got any broiled fish? Yeah. You got any pork rinds? <laughs> you got any little smokies? Got any buffalo wings? 
I don't know. Oh, I just, it just occurred to me. Probably not Little Smokies since they're Jewish. <laughs> yeah. Or pork rinds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to get to a place in the book of Acts. We can even eat those. So good news is coming. Stick with us. Come back every Sunday morning until we're free to eat pork rinds. And so Jesus showed up at all these gatherings of people. And we know from other writings in the New Testament, at least one of the gatherings was over 500 people at one time. Pretty hard to argue with that. When five, there's 500 simultaneous witnesses, Jesus is alive. And Jesus told his disciples when he'd gather with them, he told them, now listen, the Father has promised the Holy Spirit is coming. And he told them, stay in Jerusalem because God often works through a place. And he said, in this place, in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. And I want you to wait there and stay. And we talked about that last week. We talked about how when God says wait, it's for your good. We can't always see it. But I'm so glad those early disciples waited. It was for their good. I'm so glad they stayed in Jerusalem and received the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. Well, today we're going to look at the final conversation. The last time Jesus dropped in on a gathering of disciples and he spoke to his apprentices. That's another name for disciples before he went back to heaven. So Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when the, the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? So we gotta, we got to know a little bit about the context because that, that's a very powerful question and it's sort of telling that at this point, after all they've been through with Jesus, all the discussions he's had in the last 40 days with them, at this point, they are still asking, when's it going to be our turn? Is it finally time, Lord? Is it finally time, Jesus? But we got to look a little bit about where they were as a people and maybe you'll even see yourself in there as well. The Jewish people as a nation had been scattered and fragmented for centuries. For at least, I would say, six centuries, ever since, uh, I don't know if you know this, this is part of the story, ever since the Babylonian captivity, ever since they came and invaded, captured Jerusalem and, and hauled them away. Well, that wasn't the last time. Later on, some of Alexander the Great's successors came and took charge of Israel. That, that time went a little better, and that was the time when the Jewish people, many of them learned Greek. And that was the time, if you're a Bible scholar, you may have heard of the Septuagint. That was the time period, around 300-ish uh, before Christ, when the, the Bible was translated into Greek, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. But still, their country was being ruled over by another country. Not long before Jesus was born, the Roman Empire came in, and they had officially taken over Israel, along with many of the other Mediterranean countries, like Southern Europe, East, or, uh, Western Asia, and Northern Africa. And the, the Roman Empire's goal seemed to be to shape the entire world after their own image, after their government, after their architecture, after their uh, society, even after their city. It, it seemed like the Roman Empire was all about citification of the whole world. Let's just make the whole world like Rome. So the Jewish people, time and time again, were caught between the distress of a divided, fragmented country, a scattered country. There's a, a, a technical uh, word, it's, it's a Greek word, diaspora, that means the scattering, the dispersion. They, that was the state of life for Israel now for centuries. So they're caught between the distress of that life and the, and the domination of the Roman Empire. The 
people that God had called to be separate, the Jews, now lived scattered among the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, the non-Jews, were scattered among them. So life was very different. It was very unsettled for the Jews. The, they always had the threat of losing their cultural identity. Like, we got, we, had to, we got to keep hold of our language. We got to keep hold of our scriptures. We got to keep hold of our relation with, relationship with God. And the, there, there were people, there were different leaders, in, including uh, one Greek leader in particular, that said, I'm going to stamp that out. And he was requiring them to sacrifice pigs in the temple. Like, he, he was doing all this stuff to just try to stamp out the Jewish religion. So, you can imagine that even by even in Jesus' day, the Jews were very wary of anyone who would come in and say, we need to do this relationship with God differently. Whether that was someone within or someone without, because for so long, they've, they've had oppressors coming against them and saying, you got to do it our way. you got to lose yourself, and, and you got to do it our way. I, I can imagine the Jews, the Jewish people, probably many times, maybe many times a day, questioned God, God, why are you letting this happen? These are, these are your ways. We are your people. This is your land. Why are you letting this happen to us? They, they probably constantly had to look over their shoulder and be afraid of not saying something, or uh, yeah, uh, uh, be afraid of saying something politically incorrect. Does that sound familiar? Because for them, it was even beyond canceling. It, it could be killing. <laughs> It was very serious. So into this mix, this hurting, fragmented nation of Israel, God's people, into this mix, Jesus came. And he immediately starts to stir it up. <laughs> what does he do when he chooses 12 apostles? He chooses Simon the Zealot. That means he was a nationalist. He was someone who's saying, we need to revolt from Rome, we need to take back our land, we need to fight, kill, do whatever it takes to get it, make Israel great again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then Jesus also chose, <laughs> whoa, a little far right action there. But he also chose someone from the far left. He chose Matthew who was a Jewish guy working for Rome, collecting taxes from Jewish people, and he would look in his little log and he'd go, oh, I see you owe 10, 000. you owe 20,000. And he put the other 10 in his pocket from his own people. So you had far right, far left in Jesus 12. Interesting, isn't it? I'm going to say this. I wasn't planning on it. Jesus wasn't far right, and he wasn't far left. He was kingdom of God. He was actually calling people from every stripe to repent of your selfishness and come together in love and form a new people, the kingdom of God. And even us in the church, even I'm, I'm, I think I'm saying this to myself today, we are new we are a new people. We have a new calling. And it, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And while I'm passing through, I'm on mission for Jesus. That's a whole radical different mindset. And that is what Jesus brought. Jesus reaches across the aisle to build his kingdom. Now, in the book of Acts, we see that Jesus had died and risen again. So he has demonstrated his ultimate power. To demonstrate power over death, like that is the greatest power. Yeah. That is amazing. A lot of the powerful pride themselves in being able to kill. Jesus' power raises from the dead. <laughs> he, he's a resurrection. Yeah. And in, in the midst of this power display, the disciples ask, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel? and restore our kingdom? In other words, when do we get to rule our own republic? 
When do we get to determine our own destiny? When do we get to rule over others for a change? We want to feel powerful. In verse 7, Jesus replies to that request. He replied, okay, so they asked him, when's our kingdom? When's Israel going to be great again? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Now, it's interesting in this response, he does not say that time will never come. He actually implies there is coming a day when Israel as a nation will be great again. There is coming a day and uh, when there will be a, the physical kingdom uh, of Israel will be restored. The prophet Zechariah in our Bible foretold that the Messiah will come again and stand on the Mount of Olives physically. So Jesus is coming again to meet us in the air in the clouds, but he is coming a second time to earth to stand and to set up a, an earthly kingdom, and he will rule and reign for a thousand years, and I believe with Jerusalem as the capital. So they say, when's our kingdom come? And Jesus says, you don't need to know that right now. That's for the Father to know. It's going to happen. You don't, that's not the worry right now. Verse 8, he addresses the real issue. And he says, but you will receive power. You are here today asking me, when do we get our power for our kingdom to rule? Jesus says, you will receive power, and it's going to be amazing. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you now. So Jesus is saying, this is the kind of power you need now. You don't need, and you are not ready for the power to rule over others. You're not ready to rule a kingdom uh, because the kingdom of God is greater. This is not a physical power. This is not a political power. This is a spiritual power. It's not a military power even. It's a spiritual power. And that's what Jesus said. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And this is one of the greatest promises of Jesus to the church. And this promise still applies to you and me today. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There is power for you now. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say in verse 8, and you will be my witnesses. It is interesting, and I know it's probably not right but, to say this, but that word witness is you will be my martyrs. <laughs> so originally, that's what I, that's, that's, that was what they used that word for, for witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere, Jesus said, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea. Okay, all that makes sense. In Samaria? And to the ends of the earth? Wait, what? <laughs> Why would we do that? It's about the Jews, isn't it? Jesus says, I will give you my power when the Holy Spirit comes, up, comes upon you, power to witness for me, telling people about me everywhere. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and me, he will give you the motivation and the ability to be a witness for Jesus, to tell people about Jesus everywhere. Tell, tell, tell people about Jesus everywhere. And the, and the motivation and the ability to expand the kingdom of God. Not to build your own kingdom, but to, to build the kingdom of God. Here's, the, here's the, this message in a sentence. Jesus empowers you to save the world. And you could think that a couple different ways. Jesus empowers you to save the world. He is interested in saving the world. And the way he's going to do it is by empowering you. And he's empowering you for a reason, and that is to go save the world. So Jesus comes into your divided, fragmented world today. Not that dissimilar from the Jews. And he may not be as concerned as you are about who your president is. What he's concerned about is communicating his love to every person on the planet, in every country, in every language, until every person has heard the good news. Every person has had an opportunity to choose Jesus. 
the good news is that eternal life is the free gift of God to everyone who believes in Jesus for it. Okay, that's a big cause. That's a cause bigger than yourself, worldwide witness. That is awesome that Jesus is saying, wait for the Holy Spirit, and when he comes upon you, man, you're going to receive power to be my worldwide witness, to let everyone know God is love. God loves you. God wants to be with you. God wants you to be his people, and he wants to live with you. Backtracking just a little, little bit, right before Jesus went to the cross, his disciples asked him for a sign of Jesus' return. They said, when are you, what is going to be the sign, what's going to be the signal of your return and of the end of the world? And Jesus told them about wars and famines and earthquakes, but he said, that's going to happen but that's not the sign. He told them about his followers being persecuted, and we've, we've unfortunately seen so much persecution, even in our lifetime, and now we're aware of so much more because of TV and social media and everything. So all those things Jesus said would happen have been happening, but then in Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 to 14, he says, and he's talking about the end times, and what are, what's gonna be the sign of the end? He says, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. So turning away betrayal and hatred are signs that the end is near. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. Jesus addresses this again in Revelation, I think it's chapter 3, when he talks to the Laodicean church, and he even talks to the church. He says, church, your love has grown cold. Yeah. And he talks to the, 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 city, the church in Ephesus, your love is not what it once was. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Praise his holy name. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. So we're waiting for a really big, big sign. There's a lot of other signs that are sort of like, oh, that's, that's going to increase as the end is nearer and nearer. But we're waiting for this, that everyone on the planet will have the opportunity to hear the good news and then the end will come. And really, we are the generation that for the first time, this doesn't even seem that miraculous. We can totally imagine how literally every person on the planet could have access. They don't quite yet. But we can see how, oh, this is very, very possible through technology that literally every person on the planet can hear the good news. And then the end will come. And church, I don't know if you have noticed, I have noticed a change in me. I am talking more and more about the end times. I find it's just, it's just coming into messages, it's coming into my thinking. I've been starting to collect some books. I want to do a, 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 a message series at some point on the end times. I've never done that before. I've always sort of shied away from it because it's so complex, but wow, I just feel like the Spirit of God is doing something in me. Like, we, we need to be ready for those end times. And we need to be doing what Jesus wants us to do when he returns. Yeah. It could be today. It could be today. So if you are Jesus' follower, if you are his disciple, if you are an apprentice of Jesus, you are called to make sure that every person on the planet hears the good news. That is your mission. If you ever wonder, God, what is your will for me to do? Do this. Go tell someone. <laughs> make sure that everybody on the planet has heard the good news. Does that seem overwhelming? I mean, a little? Seven billion people? <laughs> uh, it's more burgers than McDonald's makes a day, I think. Um, it, is, it seems impossible for us. But I want to remind you, Jesus empowers you to save the world. Amen. Jesus empowers me to save the world. Yeah. 
In Acts 1.8, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Even if you just start where you live, that would be a great start. And then uh, there's all kinds of things you can do. You can pray for missions, give to missions, go on missions. There's, there's lots of things you can do around the world, but how about we just start right here in our corner of the world? If you're born again, the Holy Spirit is in you. He is in you. When you put your faith in Jesus, his spirit comes inside you. But Jesus said to his disciples who had the Holy Spirit in them, he had already previously breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit in them. They were saved. But Jesus said, but wait, there's more. Wait for the promise of the Father. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, he makes it very clear in Acts chapter 1 what he's talking about. It's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he said in, in verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, not just in you, but you are immersed in the Holy Spirit. Jesus says you got to do that. Be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you will receive power. Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You might be unsure if you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You may feel ignorant about it, like I just don't even know what that means. What is that? You might know a little bit about it and be scared. You might be hesitant uh, about that experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Or you may have been baptized in the Holy Spirit a while back, but now when you look at your life, you, you, your assessment is, I don't have much power. Don't really feel very motivated to share Jesus. You might feel hesitant to tell people about him because our world seems so anti-Christian. But I want you to know today, for every one of you in those categories and more, Jesus empowers you to save the world. That is his plan for your life. His plan is that you be baptized in the Holy Spirit and powerful. That you be a witness. That is his plan for you. So we're, we're still going to be in this series of, new, of great beginnings for a little while. And I, I just want to challenge you. Let's be praying that the Holy Spirit will be poured out in our lives. So if you've never been baptized in the Spirit, would you begin praying faithfully right now? Start every day. Be praying. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit, Lord. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit. I want everything you have with me. Baptize me with the Holy Spirit. And we, we will have some times along, along the road, I'm, I'm thinking and planning of, of specific emphases where we're going to say, okay, everybody, let's, let's come on up. Let's, let's pray for that. But I also want to challenge you to be praying on your own, starting now. If you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you, your assessment is, ah, not living a very powerful life, would you begin praying for that power? That is not a selfish prayer. Say, Father, fill me with this power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit afresh. And we're going to see in the book of Acts as we go along in just the first few chapters, the disciples were filled more than once. Pretty cool. Pretty awesome. Let's, let's receive. Let's pray for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, a fresh baptism. And, and we're going to need the Holy Spirit's power for the work that Jesus is calling us to do in our church. We're going to need that power. We cannot do it on our own. We're not going to be slick. We're not going to be clever. We're not going to rely on strategies of, of human thinking. Those actually are strongholds that need to be torn down. <laughs> We're going to rely on the Holy Spirit's power to do the work that the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. In Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet? And let's pray. I, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us. And Lord, I just thank you for inviting us into the biggest cause ever this worldwide cause of helping everyone on the planet hear the good news that Jesus saves and that there is eternal life through faith in you. Lord, we want to be part of that calling. Thank you for that calling. Lord, I pray that you would, you would ignite a passion in us for moving in the Holy Spirit and being your witness. I pray that we would see power, the power of God flowing out through our fingers, flowing out through our feet as we walk to places, flowing out through our mouth as we speak. I pray that you would baptize us. Holy Spirit, fall, fall, fall on us. I pray if you are a candidate 
for more of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Maybe you need a fresh filling. Maybe you need some fresh fire, some fresh passion, fresh wind. Would you raise your hand, uh, whether you're online or in the room? And would you just make your hands a cup that could receive? And let's pray right now. Would you just call out to God? Call out with your own voice. Call out and say, I need you. Holy Spirit, come in my life and in our church. I pray for your power. Pray for your filling. I pray for your baptism. We're calling out to you right now, Lord. We're calling out to you how I need you, how I want you, Lord. I want more of you in my life. Lord, I want my speech to be changed. I want my thinking to be changed. I want my priorities to be changed. I even want my wallet to be changed, my bank account, because your power is flowing through me and your mission is my passion. Lord, that's what I pray for our church. Lord, may your mission be our passion. May we be a powerful church, not a church that enjoys being together on Sunday and then goes out and, and holds our tongue, but Lord, a church that spreads love, the love of Jesus to every person we meet to the point where they're saying, why are you so loving, Lord? That's who we are. That's who we want to be in you. So pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out on us. I pray there's more, there's more, there's more, and we want it. And staying in this atmosphere of prayer, I just want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, an apprentice of his, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus for salvation, then his spirit's not yet in you. But with one prayer, you can invite him in. How do you do that? Acknowledge that you're a sinner. We are all born in sin. We are all sinners. We all need a Savior. And turn away from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. If you want to do that today, you want to be sure you're a Christian or you want to come back to Jesus, give your life to him. Whether you're watching online now or in days to come, or if you're in the room, would you just raise your hand to say, I want to become a Christian. I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want the Holy Spirit in me. I want it all. I want God. I want to repent. I want to turn to Jesus. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? And Lord, I just thank you. I, I know I can't see everybody online, but I pray, I thank you for every person in the room and online who's raising their hand to you, Lord God. Lord, we want to know that we know that we know that you're our Savior, you're our Lord. So right now, Lord Jesus, we acknowledge we're sinners in need of a Savior. We turn from our sin, we repent, we do a 180, and we turn to you. Lord God, we put our lives in your hands. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and make us new. And we choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you made a decision to put your faith in Christ today, would you please fill out a Connect card and let me know? Check one of the boxes down at the bottom there, and that will tell me about the decision you made today. Let's do this together. Amen. Amen. God bless. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Garen. Jesus empowers us to save the world. Isn't that awesome? Don't you want to be a part of that? I know I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of saving the world. Amen. All right. Guys, it was so good to see you all today. Um, if you did fill out that Connect card, if you didn't yet, now's the time. Um, you can just put it in the box right in the back, right, right in the, the offering box back there. Um, also, do not forget, um, right after service, in just a couple minutes, we're going to be having our, informa our short, short, short information meeting about the annual business meeting. Uh, we're just going to go over a couple things. It'll be great. I love you all. God bless you. See you next week.